Police identify a suspect in a deadly double shooting at Jane and Driftwood. We'll have the latest coming up tonight. Plus, police charge two men with murder in a double fatal shooting in Keswick. They say the suspects and the victims knew each other. And three members of a family have been missing from Kitchener for nearly three weeks now. We'll get an update on the search coming up tonight. And we're hearing from the chefs of Ontario's newest Michelin star restaurants, including one right here in the city at College and Bathurst. You're watching Live at Five. Good evening, I'm Lindsay Biscaya. And I'm Lena Latifat. Thank you for joining us here on Live at Five. Police have provided an update on a double homicide that happened at Driftwood and Jane earlier this week. For more on this, we're going to go live to CP24's Beatrice Baseman with that update from Police B. Lindsay and Lena, it was 2 o'clock on Tuesday afternoon that shots rang out here in this courtyard at uh, Driftwood Court. Uh, police say three men got into an altercation. That altercation then led into an exchange of gunfire, resulting two men uh, from losing their lives, a 26-year-old man and a 27-year-old man. Both of them uh, are dead now. And so police putting out photographs today of a third person that's involved in that altercation. Police are hoping that someone out there will take a look at these photographs uh, and help identify this third person. Police say he's between the ages of 18 to his early 20s. He's got dreadlocks and a beard. Uh, police are trying to determine actually uh, who, they don't know exactly who fired what shots. And so police aren't prepared to say that this person is wanted for first degree murder uh, or murder in general because they don't actually know at this point they say uh, who fired the shots that killed these two men. Simply saying that there was an exchange of gunfire two firearms recovered here at the scene. Uh, police again saying that someone out there has the information to lead them to that suspect. And I can tell you police have already been canvassing the neighborhood, uh, showing the, these photographs to people who live here in this community. Uh, and so they're eager to find this person at this point. Uh, this suspect would be considered armed and dangerous. Here's what we heard earlier from the homicide detective in charge of this case, along with the inspector here of 31 Division. I want to say overall, this is very early in the investigation. There's still a lot of things we're trying to figure out. Uh, and that's why we're here. We really want some more input from the public. I will confirm that two firearms were recovered. We believe they, they, uh, there may have been some interaction. They may have known each other. And again, that's, that's why we're here today. Uh, you know, as police, we try to do everything we can to try and figure out exactly what happened. And that's where the public's input is so valuable. It's, uh, they're going to fill in those, uh, those pieces of the puzzle that we don't have. We've got our neighborhood officers and our Toronto community housing right here behind me um, who are making, who, they're the ones who are behind the scenes doing all the heavy lifting here. So, um, you know, to the thought of, of having additional officers here uh, will help solve the problem. It'll help contribute to a solution, but it's not the final solution, right? It's a, it's a shared responsibility. So there's a small memorial here now at, at the spot, actually, the exact spot where one of the two homicide victims was found Tuesday afternoon. Uh, he was pronounced dead here at the scene. Uh, the second shooting victim was taken to hospital with critical injuries where he was pronounced dead a short time after. You heard Inspector Jacker there talking about the neighborhood community officers. It was actually a pair of community officers who were in the area doing their patrols on Tuesday afternoon, Lindsay and Lena, when they heard the gunshots ring out. They quickly responded. They tried to give CPR to these two victims. Uh, unfortunately, they could not save either one of their lives. And so, again, police now appealing to the public. Someone out there knows something. Uh, police called 31 Division with that information. The Homicide Squad, or as always, uh, you can provide an anonymous tip to Crime Stoppers as well. Back to you. All right, Beatrice Faceman reporting live from Jane and Driftwood tonight. Well, members of the community near Jane and Wilson, they're calling on the government to step in to address increasing violence. They were responding to recent shootings, including one last week on Chalk Farm Drive that seriously injured a teen. Representatives with the K. Morris Foundation, Glory Empire, and the Reset community, along with local residents, discussed their concerns today. I am petitioning all levels of government to take a look at their budgets and see how you can help to give more programs, sustainable programs that will help these young people. They need jobs. They need a mentorship. They have brilliant minds. These are young people that can do uh, great things if they're given the opportunity to, to do great things. Recently, but far too long, 
our communities have been plagued with violence, poverty, and riddles with guns. Many have heard about the incident that has taken place in Driftwood. It's not the first, but we can certainly work to make sure it could be the last. We need like stuff for our kids to do when they come home from school. We need stuff for them to do before they go to school, like what she said. Mm -hmm. The lunch program, the breakfast, breakfast. program, after school program mm -hmm. to help with homework, more computers, I guess, so they could get help with their schoolwork, at, like stuff like that, I think. Mm -hmm. And like, yeah, mentorship. Some residents of, 100, of 170 Chalk Farm say a group of men hangs out around that building, stealing packages and intimidating residents as they come and go. Well, two men have been charged in yesterday's deadly double shooting in a Keswick Park. For more on that, we're going to go live to CP24's crime analyst Steve Ryan, who is at the scene once again today. So, Steve, what do we know today? Well, first off, let's uh, acknowledge the uh, good police work done by York Regional Police. It was just shy of 12 hours after this double homicide occurred in uh, Bayview Park behind me here in Keswick at 7.30 yesterday morning. 6.30 last night, police uh, charged, arrested and charged uh, two men, a 21-year-old and a 19-year-old, with first-degree murder. Now, typically what separates first-degree murder from second-degree murder is planning and deliberation. And this call started at 7.30 yesterday morning. Uh, 911 calls uh, were received by the communications center with regards to the sound of gunshots in this park. When police attended, they located the bodies of uh, two men, now identified as Riley McDonald, 21 years old, from Keswick. And the second is uh, Mark Sutcliffe. He's 30 and there was no address given from him at the time that this information was released. At 12 o'clock, York Regional Police stood here at this location and they reassured this community that there was no threat to public safety. They said that this was, in fact, an isolated incident. And when the police say that it's an isolated incident, what that means is that they either have leads on who the suspects are or reasons for the homicide. It's important to let the community know if, in fact, there is concern for their safety. And if the police come out and say that there is not, that certainly does suggest uh, that they have uh, leads on uh, further advancing this investigation. And now we know why they knew this. The two uh, accused and the two deceased were known to one another. And this is why the police were able to make such uh, uh, quick arrests and say so quickly that this, in fact, was an isolated incident and it certainly had no impact on the safety of this uh, community itself. I did speak with a local resident earlier on today and we heard from the police as well and here's more from both let's listen I, I heard the shots actually it was in my laundry room um, and then taking my kids to school I saw them uh, doing CPR um, so yeah it was like very scary great relief to hear that they had um, arrested people and you know we can feel a little bit safer you know back right onto the park so yeah it was very scary so yeah we feel a lot safer now Investigators believe that there are no outstanding suspects and that this was a targeted incident. There is no threat to public safety. Investigators are still reaching out to members of the community who may have seen something, who may have heard something, who may have surveillance video uh, or dash cam footage from the area at the time to please come forward. Now, all violent crime has the ability to impact a community, but it's random acts of violence that are the ones that tend to paralyze uh, a community because they fear that they might be the next victims, and it certainly can't impact their quality of life. So when a community hears that it is not a random act happening, a random act of violence rather happening in their community, it certainly does alleviate the concerns when it comes to overall safety. I'll send it back to you guys. Absolutely. Okay, cp 21st crime analyst Steve Ryan reporting live for us. Thanks, Steve. Well, Waterloo police are asking for help finding a family of three who's been missing in Kitchener since September 1st. For the very latest on this, we're joined live by CTV Kitchener's Jeff Pickle. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. This family's been missing for a number of days now. I'm sure uh, family members along with the police service are concerned. What are investigators saying about what could have happened? Well, they certainly acknowledge it's a very unique and strange situation, and this is actually uh, a family of five. So the family is from Vietnam. They arrived in Toronto visiting Canada in, in early August. At some point in time, they made their way to Kitchener to visit with some friends here. Uh, then on September 1st, uh, the mother and father, so that's Ho Hawk uh, Nguyen and Trin Nguyen, along with their five-year-old son, Alex, they got in a ride share cab, is what police have told us, and left somewhere, uh, and they haven't been seen since. The other two children in the family, there's a 12-year-old and a 14-year-old, uh, they're still in Kitchener. They're still with these uh, family friends who they were staying with, uh, and the whereabouts of the three who are 
uh, missing is unknown. They really don't have really much information at all about uh, where they are. So a, a plea here, uh, these three people not uh, you know, not from the area, not from Canada, uh, missing. And so it, they said it's a really unique situation, a difficult situation to try to track uh, these three people down. Definitely sounds like a difficult situation. Do we know at this point, obviously it sounds early in the investigation, do we know, do police have any leads or can police even say whether there's a risk to the public in that area? Uh, th there, there isn't much information. They did say they have nothing at this point in time that would indicate that there's a threat uh, to the well-being of these three individuals. Uh, but then again, they don't really have much information. And certainly, they, they didn't indicate any uh, threat in the area or any uh, issue around safety in the area. It's really just, I think, trying to get these initial steps and just make some sort of contact or find out uh, where they went to in this, in this ride share uh, and, and kind of start from there and then hopefully be able to you know reunite this family and is there a message to the public at all are, are police pleading for the public's help jeff well absolutely and and those images we had of uh, hohawk uh trin and alex uh, those are the three pictures that that uh, we've been uh posting and sharing as much as possible and police sharing as much as possible but again uh they don't know where they were going again they just said ride share they don't they didn't specify a specific, you know, whether it's Uber or Lyft or what it was. So again, not a whole lot of information. Don't know if they have really any other connections with other cities uh, around Ontario. So uh, again, difficult is really the word here and just trying to blast those pictures out as much as uh, they can and hopefully someone uh, recognizes the, them and uh, gets a little bit of information to water the regional police. Yeah, so much to learn and unclear where yeah. that rideshare was going. Uh, CTV Kitchener's Jeff Pickle joining us live tonight. Thanks so much for this, Jeff. We appreciate the update. In other news, one person was sent to hospital after a collision involving a motorcycle in the Midtown area this afternoon. It happened at Mount Pleasant Road in Millwood Road area around 3.30. Police say four vehicles were involved. Paramedics say a young man was taken to a trauma center with moderate injuries. The police investigation continues. Okay, 412 now, 25 degrees outside. We will check on the commute with CP24's traffic specialist, Ad Joanna. How's it looking out there, Ed? Uh, it's looking really slow, Lindsay. Be happy that we're here, we're inside, and we're not uh, stuck behind a problem or big delays because that's what you're waiting for on the major routes. Uh, problems persist on the westbound lanes of the 401 as you make your way in the collectors. Uh, this is just through Leslie. Clean up of a collision. It's been there for over an hour now. So in the heart of rush hour, never a good thing. Very, very slow from Victoria Park. Then on the southbound lanes of the 427, this camera went out, but southbound 427 in the collectors uh, just uh, through a uh, Rathburn left lane block to the collision and looks like another one of my cameras went out, so I'll just tell you the problem. So on the uh, eastbound lanes of the 403, uh, just as you make your way past here, Ontario, have that ongoing collision now, just the right lane and shoulder blocked and on city streets, saw that ongoing collision blocking the intersection of Mount Pleasant and Millwood. Send it back to you both. This CP24 traffic report is brought to you by 407 ETR. Enjoy the journey with a stress-free commute. Well, subway service is running regularly on line two for the commute home. This after major disruptions during the morning rush. Service was suspended between St. George and Broadview for about an hour due to oil on the tracks. Chopper 24 was over the scene around 730 this morning when huge crowds were spilling onto the road at Danforth and Broadview to try and catch a shuttle bus. The TTC says the issue is the result of lubricant that's intentionally applied to keep track joints flexible, making its way on top of the track. It's 5.13 now, 25 degrees. This is Live at 5. Coming up, the Daily Bread Food Bank is detailing the urgent need for its services at its launch of its annual Thanksgiving drive. Stay with us for more. The Daily Bread Food Bank has launched its annual Thanksgiving drive as it warns of a dire situation across the city and country. Yeah, Daily Bread says it's helped two million people in the first six months of the year and it's expecting that number to double by the end of the year. It says the current situation is the direct result of unaffordability with many of its users having to spend their entire paychecks on rent. The Daily Bread Food Bank has, has had to uh, increase um, substantially its operating costs in order to, uh, to make ends meet. And that, uh, that required uh, an escalation of fundraising year over year, uh, fundraising going from about $8.5 million a year to just under $40 million a year. And, uh, and, and, and that has been achieved, but at the same time, we've run into challenges. Uh, we are... Uh, 
we know that if the level of increase of clients coming to the food bank continues at its, at its existing pace, we will start to reduce services across the city. We have food bins at every one of our 85 fire stations, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Uh, so not just during the, you know, the drives, whether it's Christmas or Thanksgiving. Um, and, you know, from our perspective, our crews uh, responding to well over 180,000 calls a year uh, are quite often the ones that, you know, when, when we're attending these calls, whether they're, you know, fires or emergencies or power failures or medical emergencies, uh, quite often we see the what exactly Neil is talking about today. Uh, we see the food insecurity. We see the individuals and the families struggling. And it really strikes a chord with the women and men of Toronto Fire Service. As part of this year's drive, Daily Bread is hoping to raise $4.6 million and more than 200,000 pounds of food. Well, 16 candidates have entered the race to represent Ward 15. Don Valley West, the official list of candidates now available on the Toronto Elections website. Former mayoral candidate Anthony Fury and TDSB trustee Rachel Chernos Lynn are among those vying for this seat. It was vacated earlier this year following the death of longtime councillor Jay Robinson. Advanced voting will be held on October 16th and the 27th, and Election Day, that's November 4th, coming up. And a provincial by-election is being held today in the eastern Ontario riding of Bay of Quinte. The seat was vacated by Education Minister Todd Smith last month when he left for a job in the private sector. Recent liaison polling suggests a close race between the PCs and Liberals, with the former having a narrow lead. The NDP finished second in the riding in the last two elections. It is now 518, 25 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. New cabinet duties for Anita Anand as the Prime Minister fills a hole after a resignation. Those details are just ahead. Welcome back. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has named Anita Anand as the new transport minister following the resignation of Pablo Rodriguez today. Anand was sworn in to her new role in a brief ceremony at Rideau Hall this afternoon. The move comes days after the Liberals lost a key by-election in another Montreal riding to the Bloc Québécois. Anand has served as the president of the Treasury Board since July 2023. She will keep her role as president of the Treasury Board. Whether it's affordable housing, whether it is delivering for the most vulnerable in our country through $10 a day childcare, through the Canada Child Benefit, for the Canadian Armed Forces in terms of supports for them, we will continue as a government to work hard every single day to build an economy and our country of today and tomorrow. Longtime cabinet minister Pablo Rodriguez, as we noted, is going to sit as an independent MP on Parliament Hill. As after he leaves Prime Minister Trudeau's cabinet, he resigned as transport minister earlier today and announced his plans to run for the Quebec Liberal leadership. Despite the leadership bid, he is staying on as an MP, at least for the time being. I have informed the Prime Minister of a resignation as Canada's transport minister and Quebec lieutenant effective immediately. And Rodriguez has held the riding of Honoré Mercier since 2015 and has since served as government house leader and heritage minister. Meanwhile, a recent poll suggests more Canadians now believe fewer immigrants should be accepted next year. Yeah, the Nanos poll commissioned by CTV News shows 64% believe Canada should accept fewer immigrants in 2025. That's up from 34% just a year ago, 72% support or somewhat support accepting fewer immigrants until housing becomes more affordable. Meanwhile, about 40% said reducing the number of new immigrants would make the economy stronger. It's 522 now, sitting at 25 degrees. Feels like 30 out there. This is Live at 5. Just ahead, we're live at a Toronto restaurant that's just received a coveted Michelin star. We'll take you there in moments. Four restaurants in Ontario received Michelin stars in the guide's latest report. CB24 Siege Lou is at one of the restaurants here in the city. Uh, it's at College and Bathurst. Hi, Siege. Tell us more about this restaurant and what foodie should expect. 
Yeah, this restaurant, it's called Danico. It's located right here in the city. The only one to be awarded a Michelin star last night. It is an Italian restaurant located inside a former bank building. And joining me to talk more about the prestigious award last night is Marco Manzoni, the general manager here at Danico. And Marco, what has the reception been like since getting the star last night? Uh, it's been great. It's been great. Uh, I have to say that we had a lot of support from our uh, guests, uh, previous guests, and uh, our regular, which uh, reached out in many ways. And uh, we also had the chance to get in touch with uh, a lot of new guests. So it was huge from uh, the moment of the war yesterday night at the event throughout the night and this morning. You know, phone were uh, blowing up uh, with a lot of congregation email messages. So it was amazing. A lot of support, I would say. Uh, and uh, it was great to hear, to see that from the guest. Yeah. Well, for all those people on the wait list trying to get in the door, what is the guest experience like and what is the food like? Uh, the food is amazing. Uh, chef is a great, talented chef. Uh, we do a contemporary Italian food uh, with a little bit of uh, Asian influence and technique. Uh, I will say that we try to offer a 360 degrees uh, uh, guest experience uh, from the moment they book the reservation when they walk to the door until the very end when they last. So we try to take uh, very good care about our guests, uh, not just uh, through the food and not uh, offering only service, but try to be hospitable as much as possible, making them feel uh, seen and is important for every time we can. Yeah. Well, it's all around service, and a big part of that is wine, too. Come with me here. We're going to go in the cellar here at the restaurant. Joining us is Ashley Foster. She is the winner of this year's Sommelier Year of the Award with Michelin Guide. And Ashley, we're here in the cellar, and a big part of the experience is wine pairing. Tell us about how important that is and how you should best do it. Well, um, I think it's it's the best way to fully experience Danico um, because you get to uh, have everything through um, chefs culinary adventure um, and then have the, the wine elevate it as much as possible as well. Um, and because Chef Daniele is Italian and my heart lies in Italian wine, um, I really had such a beautiful experience introducing guests to um, varietals that, you know, maybe they've never even tried or let alone heard of before. Um, so it's such a fun moment that I get to go to the table constantly and we're just having these fun conversations. We're um, talking about stories of these you know, small growers, and it's just, it's such a, a full encompassing experience of, of what we try to do here at Danico. Well, thanks so much, Ashley. And you heard it here. It's an all-around experience right here at Danico. Their first service since getting that Michelin star is already underway. Back to you. Look at that wine wow. cellar, too. CP24's yeah. CJ Liu reporting live. Thanks so much, CJ. It is 528, 25 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. And we are live at Jane and Driftwood tonight where police have updated the investigation into a deadly double shooting. Here's a live look. The latest on the search for the suspect coming up next. Police identify a suspect in a deadly double shooting at Jane and Driftwood. Well, police charge two men with murder in a double fatal shooting in Keswick. They say the suspects and victims knew each other. And we're hearing from the chefs of Ontario's newest Michelin star restaurants, including one right here in the city at College and Bathers. You're watching Live at Five. Good evening, and thank you for joining us. I'm Lena Latifat. And I'm Lindsay Biscaya. Welcome to Live at Five. Police have provided an update on a double homicide that happened at Driftwood and Jane earlier this week. For more, let's go live to CB24's Beatrice Faisman. Beatrice. Lena, you can see the command post behind me here at Driftwood Court and Driftwood Avenue. This is a command post that people who live here in this area uh, tell me helps them feel safer in their community. This command post was here at Jane and Driftwood Community Center uh, for months after another horrible shooting in the winter time, and so they're they're feeling a little bit more at ease having police officers here in their community station. But uh, police are now asking for people to come forward and help, and police believe that someone in this community can help lead them to a suspect that's been identified, someone that police want to talk to uh, in connection with this double homicide. Let me show you the photographs that police released earlier today. These photographs are of a man who's believed to be between the ages of 18 and his early 20s, uh, has a dreadlock, uh, dreadlocks and a beard. Police say that this uh, individual is connected to this double homicide. They say that at 2 o'clock Tuesday afternoon, there was an altercation between three men, the two deceased and this third suspect. 
This altercation escalated into an exchange of gunfire, which resulted in these two men losing their lives, a 27-year-old man and a 26-year-old man. Police say at this point, they can't confirm exactly uh, if the third individual, if this suspect we've shown you on your screen, was actually responsible for these two deaths. That's why they're not accusing him of murder at this point. But they do believe that he was at least one of the shooters involved in this exchange of gunfire. Police also recovering two firearms at the scene. And as CP24 was first to report, it was actually a pair of community, a neighborhood community officers who were on their regular patrol in the area Tuesday afternoon who heard the gunshots, ran to this area, tried to give CPR to the two victims. One of them pronounced dead at the scene. The second rushed to hospital where he was pronounced dead. And so today we heard from the homicide detective in charge of the case, along with the inspector from 31 Division about the police response in the area in general. Listen. This investigation is ongoing, and we are working to determine the sequence of the events, including who fired what shots during the altercation. At this time, we cannot confirm whether this third individual was responsible for the death of Ibrahim or Deshaun, but we do know he was one of the shooters involved. We understand how distressing this situation is for the community. We share your commitment to bringing the person responsible for the senseless violence to justice. Somebody out there knows who this person is and where they are. So I appeal to the public, please come forward, make the phone call, call Crime Stoppers if you're not comfortable, and help us locate this person. Community safety and well-being is a shared responsibility. It's not just the police department's uh, position, it's all of ours. So please make the right call. So again, police recovering two firearms used in this double homicide, or at least the exchange of gunfire, which led to this double homicide here at the scene. This third person is believed to be armed and dangerous by police. That's why they're uh, eager for someone to come forward, provide a tip to help find this person. As for the two men, police would not comment. The two men deceased, police would not comment uh, if they were known to police or if they were, they were suspected to be involved in gang activity. Uh, both of them, though, did live here in this area. And a woman that I talked to on Tuesday afternoon who told me she helped raise one of these two young men says that he did used to live here at some point before leaving but was still very much involved here in the driftwood community so if you have any information give police a call lena and lindsay back to you very interesting okay cp 24s beatrice Fazeman reporting live for us from that command post thanks b york regional police have made arrests in a double shooting in Keswick, 19-year-old John McKay and 21-year-old Ethan Pashek McNeil, both from Barrie, have been charged with first-degree murder. They were arrested yesterday, just hours after 21-year-old Riley McDonald of Keswick and 39-year-old Mark Sutcliffe were found shot in Bayview Park in Keswick. Investigators believe that there are no outstanding suspects and that this was a targeted incident. There is no threat to public safety. Investigators are still reaching out to members of the community who may have seen something, who may have heard something, who may have surveillance video uh, or dash cam footage from the area at the time to please come forward. I didn't even realize they were gunshots at the time. I thought, you know, someone moving something heavy. It didn't, it didn't even cross my mind until I saw someone outside on the ground. I, it's like such a safe community. I didn't even think it. It was terrifying. Police believe the suspects and the victims were known to each other, but they haven't released details on a possible motive. Well, members of the community near Jane and Wilson, they're calling on the government to step in to address increasing violence. They were responding to recent shootings, including one last week on Chalk Farm Drive that seriously injured a teenager. Representatives with various community groups, along with a local residents, discussed their concerns today. It's very scary because you, you never know when these, these things are going to replay itself again. There can always be a replay at any time. There can always be a replay. So it's very scary. Like, we have to know, we as a community have to be walking and looking over our shoulders because we don't know what's coming behind us. Sometimes it can even be in front of us and we can't see it as well. So it's not only looking behind our shoulders. We have to check our surroundings very well. I'm begging you, know, please, the councillor, the government, everybody who were uh, police, we need a meeting between Chalk Farm. Are we don't wait on our fall staff. Don't fall staff because if this sit down and nobody don't say anything, the youth them gonna die. And please, that's all I wanna say. 
please, I need a meeting towards the chalk farm. Falstaff, if you stop the shooting, because if you leave it, it's going to happen, and you're going to lose them lives. Some residents of 170 chalk farms say a group of men hangs out around the building, stealing packages and intimidating residents as they come and go. Waterloo police are asking for help in finding a family of three who were last seen in Kitchener earlier this month. 44-year-old Hohak, 43-year-old Trin, and their 5-year-old son Alex have been missing since September 1st. Police say they arrived in Toronto from Vietnam in early August and later traveled to Kitchener to visit family friends. They left that home in a rideshare to visit an unknown friend at an unknown location on September 1st, and they haven't been heard from since. The family also have two other children who remained at the Kitchener home. Anyone with information is being asked to contact Waterloo Police. It's 5.38 now. We're going to take another check on the roads with our traffic specialist, Adjua. Yeah, we have uh, more problems, uh, Lindsay, this time happening on the Don Valley Parkway northbound. It's just on the approach to Eglinton. It looks like a collision does have the center lane blocked. Traffic already never moves on the DVP during rush hour, but this is not going to help your drive. On to the 401. It looks like problems are still there. This is the westbound 401 if you're traveling in the collectors. Uh, just through Leslie, still those two left lanes out with that ongoing collision. Now that delay extends from well before Warden. Southbound on the uh, 427, my camera's still out, but southbound 427 collectors uh, right at Rathburn. Left lane still blocked at the collision and on the QEW problems. I can see Niagara Mountain QEW uh, just as you make your way through on the approach to Dix, you're really right at the West Mall. Collision does have the left lane blocked. Still getting word of a very serious collision in Ajax uh, that is blocking the area of Salem and Kingston Road. I'll send it back to you both. Okay, thanks, Adjua. Welcome. One person was sent to hospital after a collision involving a motorcycle in the Midtown area this afternoon. This is a live look at the scene. It happened at Mount Pleasant Road and Millwood area around 3.30. Police say four vehicles were involved and paramedics say a young man was taken to a trauma center with moderate injuries. The police investigation obviously continues. You can see the motorbike yeah. still here very much uh, banged up. Yeah, an active scene there for sure. It is 539 now, 25 degrees, feeling more like 30. You're watching Live at 5. Coming up, the NDP will join the Bloc Québécois in voting against the Conservatives' non-confidence motion. Stay with us. An update on the province's finances today. The deficit at the end of the last fiscal year was $600 million, which was much lower, better, rather much lower, better than forecast. Treasury Board President Caroline Mulroney and Finance Minister Peter Bethlin Falvey released that public accounts for 2023-2024. It shows the province ended the fiscal year with a nearly balanced budget, in part due to higher than expected revenue from international student tuition at colleges. The deficit was also nearly $700 million lower than in the 2023 budget, and revenues were up $1.6 billion. To Ottawa now, where NDP leader Jagmeet Singh says he will join the Black Québécois in blocking a non-confidence motion next week. The plan votes from the Bloc, and New Democrats eliminate the possibility of a snap election next week. Conservative leader Pierre Polyev announcing earlier this week that he would put forward a motion that states the House has no confidence in the Liberal government. We can build a movement. We've started that with our two by-election. Uh, great showings, strong presence in Montreal, and a victory in Winnipeg shows that we are the real alternative to fight back conservative cuts for people. We can do that. Uh, we're going to keep on building that mo momentum. But we're not going to play Pierre Polyev's games. We're not, we're not here to play his games. We're not here to do what he wants. We're here to fight for Canadians. So we're going to continue to do that. Saying sold out the people of Canada to sign on to a costly carbon tax coalition that taxed your food, doubled your housing costs, punished your work, and unleashed crime in your community. But then, on the eve of losing a by-election in a Winnipeg NDP stronghold, he went to Winnipeggers and he looked them in the eye. He said he had torn up the carbon tax coalition. Well, as soon as the votes were counted and he no longer needed the, the people of Winnipeg, he betrayed them. The leader of the Bloc Québécois said yesterday his party will vote against a conservative non-confidence motion. 
In other news, a famous portrait of Sir Winston Churchill is on its way back to Canada after being stolen from the Chateau Laurier in Ottawa in 2021. I spent a lot of time um, outside of work, um, like almost like a puzzle, trying to you know move the pieces around to try to figure out what other avenues we could try and how to um, direct the investigation. And um, yes, I thought a lot about you know Winston Churchill and, and Mr. Karsh. And it, it was occupied a lot of my mind over the last couple of years. A special ceremony at the Canadian Embassy in Rome marked the successful recovery of the iconic portrait after a two-year search by Ottawa police. An Italian art collector had bought the Roaring Lion portrait not knowing it was stolen. And a 43-year-old man from Powassan, Ontario faces multiple charges including theft, forgery and trafficking in stolen property. It'll be good to get that back. It's 545, 25 degrees. You're watching Live at 5. Coming up, we'll take a look at a new proposal that could see airlines being charged to resolve passenger complaints. Stay with us. The Leafs hit the ice today for their first practice at training camp at the Ford Performance Center. New captain Austin Matthews is one of 75 players taking part in camp. Only 23 players will make the opening night roster on October 9th. Plenty of questions, of course, surrounding the club heading into the season, including how the team will perform under new head coach Craig Berube. It's, it's been unfortunate, some of the, some of the injuries and, and the timing of things. Uh, but, you know, I'm, I'm trying to focus on, you know, what's, what's here now and in the future. And I think I made good adjustments this summer. And, you know, I was really happy with uh, all the different people I, I was able to work with. I think, you know, we have you know, the best staff in, in the world here. And, um, yeah, I was really happy with, with the adjustments. The Leafs preseason gets underway Sunday at Scotiabank Arena against Ottawa. Here we go again. <laughs> again. Well, the Blue Jays wrapped up their series against the Rangers in an afternoon matchup. Guerrero, Horwitz, and Schneider do up here in the seventh. As Guerrero gets one in the air, deep down the left field line and gone. Vladimir Guerrero Jr. hit two homers in the game as Toronto went on to defeat Texas for nothing. Guerrero now has 30 home runs on the year. The Blue Jays will head to Tampa, where they open a three-game series against the Rays tomorrow night. First pitch is set for just before 7. And prior to today's game, the Blue Jays announced shortstop Bo Bichette done for the season. The shortstop played just one game back before sustaining another injury. The team says he has a fractured middle finger, which he picked up while fielding ground balls before yesterday's game. Ouch. The 26-year-old had been out with a calf strain since July 19th. Four restaurants in Ontario received Michelin stars in the guide's latest report. Yeah, great news for local foodies. Mm -hmm. CB24's C. Jalou, who I think is a foodie, uh, is at one of the restaurants here in the city, Danico, at College and Bathurst. Do you get to try any of the food, C. J.? No, not yet. The kitchen just opened up, but their food is very exclusive. And uh, obviously, it's very delicious considering they are Toronto's newest Michelin star restaurant. And here to uh, show us some of their specialty items is the executive chef, Daniele Corona. Daniele, what are you cooking up here? Yeah, I am just splitting one of our starters that is a, a Murai egg. It's a local egg organic. Uh, cook at 65 degrees for 45 minutes, and then we have a seasonal vegetables uh, marinated in a miso, maple syrup, and uh, soy sauce. So we have uh, also a little bit of a sweetness. And then uh, we plate the egg like that. We're gonna finish with uh, chime di rapa crispy leaf and. Uh, Tomburi, tomburi caviar. It is completely vegetarian dish because the tomburi caviar is a, it's a seed, but looks like a real caviar. And then we have on the side the uh, kombucha sorbet. We do kombucha homemade with the lemon zest. I love all the details. Um, how did you come up with these dishes? I know the theme of your restaurant is Italian with an Asian fusion, and, and it's really a tasting menu. Yeah, basically it is a, a kind of uh, uh, egg that we prepare in it. It's like a, a simple uh, al tegamino. And then I mix it with, um, with uh, Asian influence, with uh, the, the miso and the soy sauce, and also Canadian uh, maple, uh, maple syrup uh, uh, in a marination. So it is a combination of Italian, Asian, and Canadian. 
with uh, always uh, uh, high quality products and yeah, the flavor is amazing. So you really got to try it to really know what it tastes like. But this is Toronto's newest Michelin star restaurant. And it's actually not his first Michelin star. He got one two years ago. But the first service since getting that prestigious award is already underway. And Lindsay, Lena, the phones have been ringing off the hook since I've been here. Back to you. I'm sure they have. What an accomplishment. Yeah. That looks delicious, by the way. I hope you do get to try some. C. Jalou reporting live for us from College and Bathurst tonight. Yummy. Uh, 552, 25 degrees. This is Live at 5. Up now We'll talk to the Air Passenger Rights President about a new plan to deal with passenger complaints. Stay with us. Welcome back. Airlines could end up paying huge bills to Canada's transport regulator to solve passenger complaints. A new proposal would charge airlines $790 for each passenger complaint the regulator resolves, regardless of which party actually wins the dispute. The Canadian Transportation Agency estimates it will be able to close just over 22,000 air travel complaints per year. That's amounting to roughly $17.9 million in fees charged to airlines. The backlog of passenger complaints sits at a record high of about 78,000. Yeah, so for a closer look at what this really means for you, if you're traveling anytime soon, uh, we're joined live tonight by Gabor Lukacs, president of Air Passenger Rights. Thanks for joining us, Gabor. It's good to see you again. What do you think this means for the average traveler? Good afternoon. Unfortunately, this means too little too late. Mm. On the one hand, uh, this uh, cost recovery fee is something that Parliament ordered the Canadian Transportation Agency to impose already last year in the summer 2023. And the fact that we are now here in September 2024 and it's still not in place is a disgrace. It shows the government's contempt for Parliament and for uh, the rule of law in Canada. Uh, when you talk about the amounts, it, these amounts are quite small and they are not being levied in a way that would actually create an incentive to avoid complaints because the outcome and the, and the uh, fee are independent of each other. In my view, uh, the recovery should be not only 60%, which is the current amount is based on, but a full 100% of the cost of resolving complaints where the passenger is found to have had some basis for a complaint. While in cases where it is found that the passenger was not owed even a cent, the airline should perhaps be paying a nominal fee for and the processing of the case, but generally, the airline should not be facing the same level of financial consequence if it did everything under the law as required. Mm -hmm. And now this applies to apparently valid customer complaints. So what does that actually mean? Like, what is a valid customer complaint? It, it applies to eligible ones. It's not, not valid ones. And that's the, where the problem lies. So there's an initial filtering where there are things that are outside the Canadian Transportation Agency's um, jurisdiction and or scope or completely meritless on its face just by reading what the passenger wrote. And those are being uh, filtered out. But still, there are ca cases where a passenger may not be owed any compensation. And there is no reason that the airline should be paying uh, any kind of cost recovery fee if a passenger is making a meritless complaint and but is found to be meritless at the end. At the same time, if the airline was unreasonably stonewalling the passenger, there is no reason why it should not be paying the full amount that resolving the complaint cost to taxpayers. Unfortunately, the root of the problem is that the Canadian Transportation Agency is not enforcing passengers' rights. There are no fines being issued for airlines that violate the law. And the backlog shows that uh, this is more a kind of uh, smoke and mirrors mm. than a real government determination to enforce the law to resolve the situation at a systemic level. We've got about 40 seconds left here, Gabor, but do you think the message here for the average passenger then is to file a complaint? Do you think enough people actually do that, put it in writing? We recommend passengers to avoid the Canadian Transportation Agency because of its backlog and because of its well-known history of lack of impartiality and its coziness with the airline industry. So we recommend passengers to go to small claims court. The government is trying to induce people to go to the Canadian Transportation Agency where they have a secretive, untransparent process where some outcomes may happen, but ultimately the justice is not being done nor it is being seen. Okay. okay. Gabor Lukacs, President of Air Passenger Rights. We appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gabor. Thank you very this much has been for having insightful. me. It's now 559, 25 degrees, 30 out there. You're watching Toronto's Breaking News, CB24. Thanks for watching. CTV News at 6 is next.